All right, so with that, we're going to get things started. Uh, State Senate President Matt Huffman, uh, he has another appointment later today along with uh, State Representative Susan Manchester. So we'll have them go first, and um, we'll see if we can work in some Q&A if you have any questions for them. And then we've got uh, State Representatives Angie King and Roy Clark this night who will talk, and uh, Pat Olaf and see if we power. And again, we do have a representative from Senator Vance's office is here, and I don't know if Ben Thaler from Congressman Davidson's office made it yet either. So they're here available uh, later today if you have any questions for them. So, uh, Matt, would you like to start? Thanks, Matt. Um, I, I did want to start off by saying that uh, we have, uh, as you might suspect, in the state legislature, a lot of advocates for a lot of things. And it, it's important because legislators, like anybody else in the world, only know the things that people come and tell them. And, and Matt and his, his uh, team here with uh, the electric co-op, the, the folks in Columbus, are really outstanding advocates. So I usually get uh, about an average of one email uh, a month or so from Matt explaining to me uh, a variety of things. So I don't know, whatever you're paying him, you should probably double it. So um, <laughs> yes, he didn't tell me to say that. Um, but really, uh, it, it is important. I, I think, you know, most people don't know the continuum of uh, uh, producers of electricity and then, um, you know, transporting that electricity. They don't know that there's, of course, there's uh, AEP and there's also municipal. And if you're not a co-op customer, you really don't know that, that much about it. I grew up in the city of Lima, uh, so we always had the local power company, right? Um, so that advocacy is, is very important. And these breakfasts are very important. And the food's always good also, which is very important. Matt touched just for a second on this issue on the solar and wind panels, or, or solar panels and wind. Um, and obviously there are dozens of topics that we can talk about. I, I just wanted to talk about that because it, it in a very singular way affects West Central Ohio and what we do. Um, we, we passed Senate Bill 52 in the last General Assembly dealing with this and essentially gave local control to, um, to, to local governments, including townships and, and counties, on how to actually plan these. You know, when, when they began calling these solar wind farms, that's a little bit of uh, word trickery to, because actually windmills don't grow out of the ground. Uh, they're industrial plants, is what they are. And, you know, if you go to the south side of Lima and you see, uh, you know, this, the steel plant and the tank plant, and, you know, those are clustered there along with the refinery for a reason. Well, industrial plants spread out all over um, uh, a farm field, uh, it doesn't work. Now, in some places, in some counties, they may want to do that. Well, they can go ahead and decide to do that. But if you drive uh, along inter or, or state U.S. Route 30 uh, at night and you look to the south of um, the south, yeah, the south side of uh, U.S. 30, it's the beautiful farmland that we're used to, right? It's this bucolic scene, it's a beautiful night. If you look to the north, it's the war of the worlds. There are red blinking lights everywhere and it's really destroyed the countryside. Uh, and I got an interview, you know, from a Cleveland newspaper, and I kept talking about the environmental damage. Well, it's not really polluting the environment. Well, I said, look, it may be, but um, that kind of industrial size uh, uh, creation of energy, if that's what it's actually doing, um, it, it just doesn't work. And I know it doesn't work because nobody's talking about putting these in Upper Arlington or Indian Hill or places like that, uh, they only want to come where we live and put them. Um, and my bigger, the bigger concern, frankly, is that they don't produce reliable electricity. And so we need to continue to encourage reliable energy that's also inexpensive. Um, you know, the nuclear power uh, industry has been taking a whipping uh, since the idea came up in, in the 50s, and uh, a lot of that was generated, frankly, by industries that were in competition with them. But if you can take a modular nuclear power plant and put it in a submarine or in an aircraft carrier, well, you can take that same technology and put it in the middle of Intel 
or some other giant manufacturing plant, and that can be all of its electricity. Now, that's not obviously isn't what we're talking about uh, doing here for all of you, but we, we can't let whoever has the loudest microphone decide what power is or how we're going to transport that, that power um, and because, you know, the folks who show up there every day uh, who are there to make money and not simply to serve their customers uh, aren't always going to make the right decisions. Um, so I, I think we're going to take questions. Happy to talk about uh, anything else that, that you'd like to do. Uh, do for that, but um, we've got you've got a great uh, set of legislators up here. Roy and Angie, uh, Susan's moving up to the Senate, I believe, in in January of 25, and she'll do a great job there. She's she had this speech about pushing Senator Huffman out of the way as she walks in the door, but I'm not sure. If, hopefully, she won't do that while I'm here in, in your presence, right? So. Um, but it's a pleasure. This is always a great event. I enjoy coming. And should I just turn it over to Susan? Is that all right? So, Representative Manchester. Well, thank you. And I do just want to echo some of the sentiments that have already been said. Thank you to all of you for what you do and the kind of support and advocacy you bring. As Matt Berry already mentioned, this grassroots support and being able to come and advocate to the legislature for your cause is huge. And I really appreciate you taking the time to be here to ask us questions and advocate for what you need. My name is Susan Manchester. I'm the representative for the 78th House District, which covers all of Allen County and Northern Auglaize County. I was first elected to the legislature in 2018, and I am very proud of some of the accomplishments that we've made in that time. We've balanced the budget while cutting taxes, including the largest tax cut in Ohio history. We've cut red tape for small businesses, protected our constitutional rights, and defended innocent life. I'm very proud of those things that we've done, but I still believe there's a lot of work left, and not because President Huffman hasn't been doing a great job, because he has been as a Senate president and our president for this, or and our senator for this area, but he's term limited, and so I am running for the state Senate district, which includes Allen, Auglaize, Mercer, Shelby, Dark, Champaign, and Logan counties. So looking forward to that opportunity. I will be on the ballot in March of 2024 and would love to have your support. One thing that I do want to talk about that I've been working on ever since I came to the legislature is Ohio's beginning farmer tax credit program. This is legislation that I actually got started on on the campaign trail and then when I came to the legislature was able to introduce this program and what it does is it awards a tax credit to an outgoing farmer who either sells or rents their land or assets to a beginning farmer. And a beginning farmer, in turn, receives a tax credit to take a qualified financial management course, which is offered through a number of our partners throughout the state. I'm proud to say this legislation was enacted into law, and the program is now up and running. If you go to the Ohio Department of Agriculture's website, the application is now open for both beginning farmers and outgoing farmers to apply for the next tax year. I'm also very excited to announce that we have our first beginning farmer who's successfully gone through this program. He's a young man from up in Delphus who was actually able to purchase land and because of his participation in the program, the farmer that he purchased land from received a 3.9% tax credit. So knowing that there are a lot of farmers in the room, I would be remiss to not mention that program and encourage you to check it out. As I mentioned, all of the information is on the Ohio Department of Agriculture's website. Again, this is something that I feel very passionately about. I grew up on a family farm. We are currently in the sixth generation of operation. And going back to what President Huffman was talking about with wind and solar development, I think we're seeing a lot of interest in prime farm ground from a number of areas that uh, I don't know that us farmers really want that kind of interest. <laughs> so um, I believe that this program is intended to continue to preserve our rich history of agriculture in the state of Ohio. And so I would encourage you to check it out and hope that others can participate and benefit. Thank you. 
Thank you, Susan. Uh, you guys okay for a few minutes to stay? And All right, so State Representative Angie King. Good morning. That's probably wondering, saying, oh no, she's got two pages. Well, they're just notes in their large font because of my eyesight. So I assure you, it's not going to be 20 minutes. But um, thank you for having us here today. Uh, my name is Angie King. I'm state representative for the 84th district, probably a new face to many of you. So the 84th is now southern All Glaze County, including Wapakoneta. Northern Dark, including Greenville, and all of Mercer County. And it's really an honor to represent the 84th District. And I want to start off by just sharing my appreciation for Midwest Electric. And they've been especially helpful to me as a new member and helping me to better understand some of the power reliability concerns. And in September, I was given an opportunity to tour the peak gas plant in Convoy. And that was very insightful and very helpful. And since I'm not an energy expert, um, and it's important for our rural voice to be heard in Columbus, I so much appreciate that I can pick up the phone at any time and call Matt and get his opinion on uh, pending legislation. And he really does, as President Huffman mentioned earlier, does an excellent job of representing um, the cooperative and specifically Midwest Electric. So you really do have a great advocate on your behalf. So what do we want? We all want safe, reliable, and affordable electric, but it's getting harder and harder as the demand increases and we've got this big push for net zero carbon emissions and renewables, which of course are weather dependent. And so our energy landscape's changing, grid re reliability and the potential for rolling blackouts are real concerns. And I'm of the opinion that uh, it's oil, coal, and natural gas. We need more of those, not less. And so one of the bills that I've been working on since um, becoming a state legislature is House Bill 4, which is less legislation that will address financial institutions and other businesses that conduct economic boycotts or discrimination against companies or customers based on certain factor or criteria, such as ESG. You're probably wondering, what is ESG? So ESG is Environmental, Social, and Governance. It's kind of like a, a credit score. It's really stakeholder capitalism where investments are used to support a particular social or political agenda versus investing to maximize the rate of return. In some cases, it may even impact access to capital. For instance, there are some uh, financial firms that purposely avoid the oil and gas industry or they've cut ties with carbon emitting energy companies and instead will only invest in green or renewables. House Bill 4 will also prohibit our state pensions from ESG investing. And this is really about consumer protection because it's well documented that ESG investments underperform traditional investments. And instead, as I spoke earlier, instead of investing to maximize the rate of return, these money managers are using other people's money to make investments to impact social change or achieve a political agenda. And they're investing in companies based on their carbon footprint, uh, employee gender diversity, social issues that the company may or may not be supportive of, and even the diversity of the, the governing board. So right now there's approximately 20 states that prohibit ESG investing, and so I'm hopeful that Ohio will soon become the 21st. And again, just want to thank you for the opportunity for being here and everything that you do, and also thank you for supporting our local community through the Cooperatives Community Connection Fund. Thank you very much, and I look forward to ask, answering any of your questions, and I guess I'll pass the mic to State Representative Roy Kloppenstein. Good morning. It's good to be here. 
as you notice, the more seasoned legislators don't have to have notes. And, and my problem is I get started talking and I go down a rabbit hole and don't state a script and then you get in trouble. But first of all, thanks, Matt, for the invitation. I appreciate being here. My background, I'm the 82nd District, which is Van Wert, Paulding, Putnam, and the southern half of Defiance. So Midwest Electric, I believe, is a little bit in Putnam in Van Wert County. I'm a member of Paulding Putman uh, Cooperative myself. So why do I have a passion for energy? When, I, when Matt invited me here, I said, well, how long do you want me to talk and what do you want me to talk about? And he left them both open. So hang on. But why do I have a passion for energy? I tell folks my real job, I'm a farmer. I love what I do. Somehow, I ended up in the commissioner's office. And after two and a half terms, I ended up in the legislature. So I'm still a farmer. I just happened to go to Columbus and really appreciate coming back to Northwest Ohio. But farming relies on energy. Fertilizer, diesel fuel, transportation, everything we do as farmers relates back to energy. Just by where I live, which is Paulding County, we're the wind capital of Ohio. Pro or con, that's just the way it is. And my experience with that industry got me really interested in energy. And it made me aware of some serious threats to our way of life. And if we go back to the early to mid 2000s, 2007, 8, when the first land acquisition agents come to Northwest Ohio to lease ground, a group of us farmers were talking and we asked, why are all these companies from overseas? What are we missing? Why aren't we doing this investment? So a few of us, and, and this is a brief part, and I'm not going to talk about it, but a few of us farmers said, let's go after it and do it ourselves. Well, our first attorney says, go get a Q position with PJM. And I said, Who P who's PJ? And, and so I started getting this education. And if no one ever has heard of PJM, uh, it's a good read. They do a lot of good things for us. But it made me aware of energy, and I've never quit learning. When I went into the commissioner's office in 2013, it's when the first pilot payments were coming in, so it's a, a, a quite a part of our budget in Paulding County. But it made me aware of what was going on. So when Matt asked me to speak, I thought, you know what, I'm going to talk about something that most people don't want to talk about, and that's lobbyist. You know, lobbyists and lawyers, nobody likes them. No offense. No offense. But the truth is, when you talk, when I first ran for office and talked about lobbyists, people said, don't call them lobbyists. People don't like them. Call them industry representatives. So when Matt asked me to talk, I thought, I'm going to talk about Acre which is the lobbyist sort of organization. And I went to look up Acre, and they changed the name. It's now National Rural Electric Cooperative Association. And Matt didn't tell me to talk about this. Last night, when I come in from Shell and Corn, I went to Midwest Electric website. I thought this was an appreciation dinner. And it turns out it's a PAC meeting. So I thought, you're going to think Matt paid me to talk about it. He didn't. But why should you be a member of this National Rural Electric Cooperative Association? As a farmer, who represents me? And I would guess there's a majority of farmers or people connected to the farm in here. But we have the Soybean Association, Corn and Wheat Growers, the Cattlemen's Association, Pork Producers, Farm Bureau. We have a host of lobbyists representing us as farmers. And we all think they're great because they're representing us. But why should you be a member of this rural electric uh, representation? Well, the first thing, ag and rural electric has what I'm going to call a generational change. We're down to less than 2% of the population being farmers. 
When we used to have a family reunion, where did we go? Grandpa's farm. We are a generation away from Grandpa's farm, and I will tell you there are a host of legislators that know nothing or very little about farming. It's the same thing with our rural electric cooperatives. I could ask for a show of hand, but who in here, don't do it, I'll be dating you, who in here remembers the day electricity come to your home? There's not many of those folks left. My dad talked to me about when the final home got electric. There was a purpose. I have not talked to my sons about it. Four sons, two grandsons, one granddaughter. She's incredibly cute. But anyway, so there's a generational change from the folks that realize what our co-ops have done for us. So why is it important to you be a member? First of all, we don't have a sustainable national energy policy. It's a problem. We don't really have a state energy policy. It ought to be a goal for Ohio to have reliable, affordable, sustainable power. If we would do that correctly, economic development and businesses will be set for a generation in Ohio. If we do it wrong, they will go somewhere else. What's the difference between a first, second, and third world country? It's energy. Everything we do, our standard of living, relates back to energy. EV vehicles. I know two people that drive an EV vehicle. One because he can, and it's pretty fun to drive a Tesla. The other one, it actually fits their lifestyle. But EV vehicles are being, in my opinion, pushed down our throats. They're going to push us to a third world status. They're misguided. We're closing and regulating thermal energy production out of existence, mainly coal, some gas, we're not developing nuclear. Solar and wind, although it has been a tremendous benefit to Paulding County, will not replace gas, coal, and solar. Last I checked, I'm still looking for the person that can turn the wind on and off. I'm looking for the person that can stop the two inch snowfall over the array of solar panels for the solar production that was planned for that day. I haven't found that person. Because of, of a time limit, I'm not going to go too much farther, but if, I, I'm a number guy. I always like math because two plus two is always four, although sometimes in the legislature it might get a little fuzzy, but. Math is definitive. You know what it is. And I'm going to read this next statement, but I'm going to tell you how serious this issue is. And I didn't do this research, but if EV vehicles would replace petroleum-based vehicles, and I believe this was just on automobiles, what would it take? Currently, there are 129 oil refineries in the United States. On average, to replace that energy production, it would take two David Bessey nuclear plants for each refinery. That's 258 new nuclear plants for United States to go to EV vehicles. What has been built nuclear plant-wise to in the last seven years. One in 2016, the next one after that was in July of this year in Georgia. I can run the numbers. If we build one nuclear plant on average every seven years, somebody's not going to be commuting somewhere if we're using EV vehicles. And the interesting thing about green energy and the fallacy 
That's why you need to be a member of this PAC organization. We have a lot of education to do. It's, I, I want to say the EV thing is a pie in the sky. It may get there, but everyone I have asked, when will you buy an EV vehicle? The answer typically, if you think about it, is when it makes sense for me. Unfortunately, our tax dollars are subsidizing them. There's a massive backlogs of vehicles. It's not there yet. I trust the consumer. I'm going to stop. I, I could get on a passionate roll here. But I encourage you, if you are not a member of National Rural Electric Cooperatives Association, you need to be a member. I think their uh, membership starts at $25 a year or $2.08 a month. See, I studied that. You need to be a member because we have a lot of folks that need educated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to our speakers. So again, Senate President Huffman and State Representative Susan Manchester have to leave in just a few minutes. So we'll do uh, things a little bit out, out of order, not a, not a problem. If anybody, does anyone have any questions specifically for Senator Huffman or State Representative Manchester? Again, the rest of the group, and Pat O'Loughlin is going to speak here in just a minute. The rest of the group will still be here. But before they leave, any questions for State Representative Susan Manchester or Senate President Matt Huffman? Come on, don't let them off that easy. Here we go. Is anybody, yeah, Joe? You know, there are things wherever you are on the political spectrum um, that are fundamental to our culture. Um, not only uh, marriage and, and relationships between uh, men and women that, that all need to be protect, protected, uh, but also a sense of fairness. Um, and, you know, we hear people say, well, it's not happening that much. Well, then, okay, we're, we're not really uh, causing too, many, too much pain. And um, there, of course, are a lot of ways for people to participate in athletics than, than um, uh, to, to do that. So it's just um, it, it's, it's, uh, something else on the compendium of things that if you get a small, loud group of people walking through the uh, state house screaming, that somehow somebody in the media or somewhere else thinks that makes sense. I had somebody who was going through the breakfast line, somebody mentioned to me, well, all of the things are going on with the Washington and the Republican Party and how do we keep the Republicans together. Well, one thing is to have fearless legislators like the, the folks you see up here right now who are not going to immediately bend to whatever it is that they see on TV or they see on social media. You know, people used to say, don't believe everything you see in the newspapers. Really don't believe everything that you see on Twitter. Because who knows who's saying it or why they're saying it or anything like that. Um, so we're going to take care of that uh, in Ohio before the end of the year. I'm, I don't see any reason why Governor DeWine wouldn't sign the bill. Okay. I don't know if you want to. Yeah, I just um, want to let you people know a little bit about the refineries. I worked at one for a good number of years. And the state makes sure that they don't pollute. They make sure that they have all the most advanced technology to work on pollution. I spent so much time as a supervisor guarding the state's laws. And uh, they're there to help us, not to hurt us. This electric stuff is not going to work. And if I have to do a little studying, and you can see it pretty easy. And yet, I seen on news last night where we're uh, really grilling the kids on these new electric trucks that can drive 300 miles and then rest for 10 hours and then drive 300 miles again. 
Do you think this isn't going to increase some cost? Anyway, help these guys to stop this electric any way we can. Yeah, and I think along those lines, Synovus Refinery is in my district and Senator Huffman's district, and unfortunately, the Ohio House passed a bill that would require all refineries to hire only union employees who had gone through a specific training program, all under the guise of safety, but in reality, we know that the refining industry is one of the most highly regulated industries, not only on the state, but also the federal level. So that was something that I voted against, and I know that for me personally, it's not going to help our energy production if we continue to put more strings on one of the most regulated industries in the state. And I would just comment that, that you know, the refinery in Lima, which, you know, if you live in Lima, everybody lives fairly close to, the, to a refinery, right? My brother, until just a couple of months ago, worked there. Um, and, you know, if it wasn't safe, obviously, I wouldn't be living there. And it's essential that we support these industries. Um, and, you know, Susan's right. The safety protocols are there. I, I wouldn't have my family living there if I didn't think that that was true. I've toured the plan as, as these other reps have on a number of occasions. So um, it, it, it does come down to people with money who want to make more money by going to the government and saying this is a better idea. Um, and uh, we're, we've, we've done a lot, I think, to help the oil and gas industry, opening up the public lands to drilling. Uh, but there are people who are against it. Sometimes they say it's because of environmental, but the real answer is they got their money invested in windmills. And they're getting credits from the, gov the federal government and things like that. So um, I think this crew up here and, and most of the state legislature is on the same page. A couple of quick questions and a uh, statement. Uh, my wife and I go down to Florida, and we take two horses to ride down there. Not too far from where we're going, there's the largest wind farm that I've ever seen. It's like four or five miles on Route 10. Nothing but wind, not wind, I'm sorry, not wind farm, solar panels. Just acres and acres and acres of solar panels, which is just taking up a lot of ag area. So, and as an electrician myself, I know wind and electric is never gonna be substituting for um, nuclear power or coal. Is there anything being done in the state of Ohio that any of you would know that anything uh, possibly be developing uh, towards nuclear power? Because I, I, I will say this to the people, my people don't re um, recognize it maybe, we don't have no problem sending our kids, women and children, on nuclear powered ships out at sea to defend our country and other parts of the world. But we don't want it in our backyard. Nuclear power is, is very sustainable power. And nuclear power, you have to understand it, it's cold driven. So and we, need, we need nuclear power to be able to sustain what we have. Wind and solar is not going to do it. So I'm curious about the uh, development of nuclear power for the state of Ohio. Mm -hmm. Well, as going to the original point about the wind and solar, I think Senator Huffman mentioned we did pass House Bill or Senate Bill 52, which would give local control to both the county commission and the township trustees as far as the development of wind and solar in the state of Ohio goes. And I know that most of the counties in this area did designate themselves as exclusionary zones. One of the things that we're facing now are some of these smaller scale projects that are still trying to get through. And I think for me, the question is always, are we gonna trade good farm ground for these projects that we don't have long-term viability for. As far as the development of nuclear goes, I am not aware, and I might pass it off to President Huffman, but I'm not aware of any further development that's happening in the state of Ohio. We obviously have our nuclear power plants that are continuing to run. And I think Representative Kloppenstein made a good point about energy being what drives a first world country. And I can speak from experience. I lived in Venezuela for a year and blackouts were just a normal part of life. The power went off at any moment, any time, and we never knew when it was coming back. And unfortunately, 
there are threats of that coming to America, and we all know that's not the America we know and love. And so I think it is critical that we at the legislative level do everything we can to make Ohio a very attractive state for energy development, and part of that also lies and making sure that we're not regulating it so hard that people don't have an interest in coming here and developing. So specifically, I don't have anything that's on the horizon, but I know that this is something at the forefront of all of our minds as we look to our energy future. And I, I, Part of the problem here is that this is also the, the licensing is controlled by the federal government. Um, the thing about nuclear power is it is reliable, um, and it, compared to, certainly to the solar and wind is very, very expensive to, to uh, create the same amount of energy that you can with nuclear power and, and certainly with coal and, and gas. Uh, but it's controlled by the federal government. If we could do it by ourselves, uh, I think certainly you'd have a lot more of it. Um, and there are, um, and, and oh, oh no, by the way, it's also carbon free. And I will tell you, this is, you know, what's happening now with solar and wind and the, the folks who are making money of that, pushing it out of the way, um, they wouldn't want to say it today, but one of the industries that was trying to keep nuclear power from being developed in the 60s and 70s was the oil and gas industry. Why? Well, money was coming out of their pocket, right? So we had Jane Fonda in a movie about a nuclear power plant melting and going all the way to the earth to China, the China syndrome, right? So those are just the kinds of uh, political games that get played within the media and the culture to do that. I think the future is nuclear energy. Uh, the technology is already there um, and, and it's going to be reliable. The, the, the electric vehicle craze is it's kind of fun to talk about and if you drive on a golf cart you know you're driving an electric, electric vehicle but my daughter uh, just had a baby two days ago in Pensacola, Florida. It's about 825 miles from here. If I, it takes me three days to drive to Pensacola to see my grandkids, I'm not going to do it, okay? I can get on an airplane, by the way, which does use uh, oil to, to fly, so that's what people end up doing. Um, Susan and I are in a panel at 10 o'clock in Lima, and despite what you may have heard, we are not exempt from getting speeding tickets. Uh, so maybe one more question for us, and I know Roy and, and Angie would have questions too. So. Just a quick question here, off subject here, but your thoughts on issue one and two. Sure, so, so issue one is on the ballot. I want everyone, I, I'm, I'm voting no, I think all of you should vote no. Issue one uh, is the most radical abortion policy in the United States. We would be more radical than what the state of California has. It's abortion on demand right up until the time of birth. And additionally, because of the way that it's worded, it would also allow any person, which includes a 15-year-old girl, to go in and get medical treatment even without their parents' consent. Now, some people say, well, it doesn't say that in there. Well, when the Founding Fathers passed freedom of speech as part of the First Amendment in 1791, and that was adopted by all 13 states, well, they didn't say anything about pornography. That's not what they were thinking about. But in 1966, the U.S. Supreme Court said, oh, well, it means pornography, too. So certainly some court, and there are some very liberal judges, as we know in the state of Ohio, none around here, but in Columbus and Cleveland, Cincinnati, who are going to interpret it that way. So, um, you know, the, the, there are a lot of pro-choice abortion people who realize how radical this is who are going to vote no, but it's going to be very close. And if you don't, you think your vote doesn't count, well, it's going to count because this is going to be very close. The second issue, issue two, legalizes, they, they say recreational marijuana as though well, the only time somebody may be doing it is when they're sitting on their back porch or something. Uh, the answer is you can buy marijuana and use it whenever you, you want. And um, it, the science is pretty clear that using marijuana, especially using extensively, causes mental illness in the long run. You can look at the studies in uh, Amsterdam, you know, had legalized marijuana for decades up there. And almost certainly, it's going to be now more available to children. Well, people say, well, it's illegal for children. Well, yeah, but if it's available, 
if somebody's going to buy something because it's legal to do it, and the problem that we have with, uh, in, in many places, with teenagers who have mental illness, who are considering terrible things to doing to themselves and others, it's going to be um, augmented more if this is passing. So I'm asking everyone here to, to vote. You gotta go, it doesn't matter if you're against it if you don't vote. Go vote and vote no on issue one and issue two. So here you go. I'll just add a few things to that. I am also adamantly opposed to issues one and two and would encourage all of you to vote no as well. I think one thing to point out in line with some of the questions that have come up, issue one, the language of it describes a pregnant person. It doesn't even refer to a pregnant person as a woman. And I find that extremely troubling as a woman. And unfortunately, that kind of language is what opens the doors for all of this nonsense about what it means to be a man or woman and redefining it completely. So that's another problem with issue one. If we didn't have enough already, the fact that it would allow abortion on demand and completely undo the good work that the legislature has done to protect innocent life. One of the first first bills that I had the pleasure of voting for when I came onto the legislature was the heartbeat bill. And I think we made a lot of progress for defending life in the state of Ohio, and issue one would completely undo that. On recreational marijuana, or marijuana, because that's just what it is, we all know that workforce is a huge problem in this state, in this country, and marijuana is not a motivational drug. <laughs> it is not one that has a long-term effect of getting people up and working, and that's the last thing we need right now. The safety concerns are tremendous when it comes to this drug, and I'm also extremely concerned about the effect it will have on our youth, and then in turn, what that's going to mean 10, 20 years down the road. So please vote no on issue one and two. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, at this time we'll have Pat O'Loughlin, CEO of Buckeye Power, come up and talk about the energy industry. Thanks, Matt. Well, First of all, thank you all for being here, um, and thank you for supporting not only your co-op, but the political action initiatives that, that we need for a common sense electric supply system. You're uh, part of one of 25 electric co-ops here in the state of Ohio, over 800 of them across the country, and it's people like us getting together to protect our interests in politics that is the reason that we have this political action committee and it's the reason why we're getting together today. The uh, slide's working, there we go. You can see the network of Ohio cooperatives. Uh, we have set out to own and control the generating resources through the company that I work for, Buckeye Power, to provide the electricity needs that you have every day. You've heard a lot about wind and solar and coal and nuclear. So we produce most of our power with coal. We also use natural gas, we use solar. We use biogas, we, use a, we believe in a diverse set of everything, all of the above for electricity supply. And the results of that have been relatively stable prices, lower than most, uh, and they've gone up less than others around the, the state and around the country over the last couple of years, and a reliable delivery of that electricity, which is so important to all of you. Part of that um, issues that we heard about today I'm, I'm not going to tell you what I think. I'm going to show you a little bit about what other people are saying around the, the country. The North American Electric Reliability Corporation is entrusted with, by Congress and by the federal government, to study the reliability of our network of interconnected utilities across the country. And they do an assessment every year, every summer and every winter. Um, just like uh, a stoplight here, red is bad, it means we got problems no matter what. Yellow means we're gonna, it's, we should be worried we're going to have problems if we have extreme weather events. And by extreme, I mean if it gets above 95 degrees in the summer or below zero degrees in the winter. We all know that happens around here every once in a while. Um, and so we, we have been on this path for a while now of slowly eliminating fossil generation that is needed for a reliable system and replacing it with federally subsidized wind and solar and other less reliable sources. At the same time, we have an increasing demand for electricity, and we have federal rules that do not recognize in the markets that we operate in 
the value of reliable electric supply. They again favor wind and solar over traditional reliable sources of electricity. On 3 a.m. on December 24th this year, you remember it was pretty cold that day, to tell me we were uh, facing imminent blackouts if people didn't start reducing electricity. And I thought to myself, well, I'm not really sure who I'm going to ask to do anything about that right now, but we're, we're going to get busy and try. Uh, fortunately, it was Christmas Eve, and most people weren't working, and um, we, we got through that okay. But, but right now, any time it gets cold, we're faced with these emergency events. And this, this is PGM's look ahead. They are, they are today saying that about 20% of the electric resources in their footprint are slated to be closed by 2030. 20% 20 by 2030. We've already closed about 20% over the last 10 years. Um, and it, the, the color on this chart, it's a little busy, says the primary reason is government policy. That's the biggest reason why we're going to close power plants going forward. And then the news gets a little worse because here's what we're going to replace it with. This is about 80% solar, about 10% wind, and 10% stuff that actually works on days and nights when you need it to. So this is, this is where we're headed over the next seven years right now, according to our grid operator. And again, what's the biggest force behind this? It's, it's government policy. Um, there's a lot of things that we do in this industry that are very technical, somewhat complicated, trying to figure out how all this works. Some of it's pretty simple, though. Um, we got to produce the same amount of electricity as people use. Uh, electricity demand is still going up in this country. That's the, the pink lines there. Depending on how fast you think they're going up, they're going up. Um, and then the blue line is traditional generation that we use to support our grid day in and day out. The green is renewable generation, which you can see we're already depending on renewable generation uh, some days of the year. And uh, here over the next few years, we won't even have enough renewable generation to take care of that. We're, we're going to be counting on turning people's lights off to take care of it. This is the forecast from PJM. Again, not a very complicated story, but this is the path we're on, and seven years is not a very long time in this industry. We heard some questions today about nuclear power. I think nuclear power is going to be part of the answer going forward because it, it is a non, no emissions, reliable, baseload kind of generation. It's not the only answer, but I think it's certainly a big part of what we, we need going forward. But as we stand here today, uh, we're 20 years from the next nuclear power plant being built here in Ohio or anywhere else. That's how long it takes to go through the siting and planning and construction process. The, the, there's a nuclear power plant that just went in service this summer. It was started in 1999. 1999, that's when they committed to build it. There's the second unit that will be coming on a little later this year, early next year. Um, and it's largely going through the government red tape and the expense that goes with it. It also ended up costing twice as much as they thought it would when they started building it in 1999. Or started planning it, I should say, not building it. So, um, so we've got this real issue, and uh, I never thought this would be the case, but today reliable electricity has become somewhat of a bipartisan issue. Uh, people either believe in wind and solar as the answer to everything, or they have a different approach that says, you know what, we're going to need fossil fuels for a long time to come because that's what depends, that's what is the backbone of all of our energy systems, especially electric. And unfortunately, that's, that's the... Uh, that's why we have a political action committee, is to try to get that message across. Your national association that you all are a part of has been the leading voice for that. We're starting to make some progress. We're starting to see other people like PJM, like the North American Reliability Council, confirm what we've been talking about for the last few years. And maybe we're going to start to see some turns. At the same time that that's been happening, here's what's happened with emissions. Okay, This is state of Ohio, electric power. Everything we do has gotten cleaner and better over the last 20 years. It's going to continue to get cleaner and better no matter what. We operate power plants that are as clean as they can be. Uh, everything in life is full of trade-offs, but you know our mantra at our office, all we talk about every day is safe, reliable, affordable, and environmentally responsible electricity. And we can do it. Uh, we've shown we can do it. Um, but we do need the government to get out of our way because right now that's, as I said, the biggest obstacle we have to get there. So thank you again for your participation. Thank you for your support. Uh, we're going to continue to lean into this and push forward. Uh, the folks here in the state of Ohio have been understanding, somewhat helpful. It's mostly a federal issue at this point. Um, but I think we're going to need more help from the state um, to help people in the federal level understand where we need to be. So thank you again. appreciate it. And I don't know if you want any more questions, but thanks for your support.
Thank you, Pat. So we'll uh, we'll go back to Q and A. So we've got Pat here. We've got state representatives Angie King and Roy Klaffenstein, and then we have uh, Timothy Schneider. He's a representative from Senator Vance's office. He's here as well. Senator Vance has been a good supporter of us on energy issues, uh, so we appreciate that. And um, so, open up uh, Q and A here. Yeah. So the question: uh, There's an aggregation ballot uh, number of you are from Mercer County uh, and, and Auglaize County has aggregate electric aggregation, Allen County has electric aggregation and uh, so it's on the ballot this fall in Mercer County and that would uh, affect uh, just customers of AES or DPNL and AEP. Uh, it does not affect uh, Midwest Electric, it does not affect the municipal electrics like Salina. Uh, and what it does is it would just take those customers and allow the county to aggregate or combine them all into one big load, so to speak. And theoretically, then, they could go out and shop that load for lower prices on behalf of those customers uh, just on the generation component. There, there's three parts to your electric bill. There's generation, transmission, and distribution. And this electric aggregation is just generation. So when you hear these uh, marketers say that they, they get it for like seven, seven and a half cents per kilowatt hour, and you're sitting there as a Midwest Electric, Midwest Electric member thinking, well, you know, you're paying 11, 12 cents a kilowatt hour. That, that's not right. Well, they're only talking about the generation part of it. Uh, so it only affects those customers. It doesn't affect Midwest Electric. We're, we're neutral. We, it doesn't, doesn't bother us one way or the other. Um, and uh, we already are an aggregator, so to speak. That's what an electric cooperative is, not just locally, but then collectively statewide. Uh, through Buckeye Power, all the co-ops in Ohio are aggregated, so to speak. And Buckeye Power's generation rates, he didn't, I don't think he had a slide up there about it, but Buckeye's generation rates are, are right there with, with, with uh, the, the most competitive rates in Ohio anyway. So that's, that's what that's about. It's not a problem. We're not opposed to it. Uh, on a federal level, we'll soon get to replace uh, Mr. Brown. There are three candidates running right now. I know you can't tell me, but could you help us understand which one would be the best candidate to send to the federal level to help with the electrical problems we have? Sure, yeah, so on the U.S. Senate side, Sherrod Brown is, is the other senator from Ohio, and uh, he, he hasn't been as helpful to us on these energy issues. Um, I don't know, uh, and I'll defer to Mark Armstrong, I don't know that, uh, uh, speaking on behalf of, uh, you know, making a, a uh, endorsement of any of those candidates. I don't think we've done that. Uh, my guess is uh, that uh, all of the candidates are probably very similar and, and aligned with, uh, with us on, on the energy side, at least. Mark Armstrong is the legislative director for the Ohio's Electric Cooperatives. Uh, good, good morning, uh, Mark Armstrong. As Matt said, uh, I'm with Buckeye Power and with Ohio's Electric Cooperatives. Sorry, we're getting a little, little feedback here. Uh, to the question about uh, the candidates running for the U.S. Senate, uh, you know, generally, I could probably just talk loud, but um, you know, we're, we're not taking a position. We haven't endorsed any of them, uh, and. Certainly would look forward to working with any uh, of those three. Um, like Matt said, Senator Brown has not been very helpful on the generation side in, in supporting uh, fossil fuel generation in the state of Ohio. Um, so we're not making endorsement. We look forward to working with all three of them. I think they're still putting their energy policy out there uh, in anticipation of the, the May primary. Um, I haven't heard any of them say anything uh, antagonistic uh, about, um, about fossil fuel generation, which is important to us. Uh, certainly, we're, we're, what we're looking for out of members of Congress and, and the Senate is to push back on these EPA regulations and Department of Energy regulations that uh, make Buckeye Power's job a lot more difficult, if not impossible, if they were to become implemented. Um, and, and I think the Republican candidates are, are all kind of in line with, with that. I haven't heard specific statements, but we look forward to, to working with, with all three of those, any, whoever comes out of the Republican primary. And, and I think it's gonna be a, a very stark contrast 
uh, to Senator Brown um, when you when you go to choose in November. That's yeah. that's kind of all we can say there. And I, I just add what Mark said uh, to shout out to Senator Vance, who's really been a great partner with us so far on energy issues. Uh, we didn't know him real well before he was elected, but um, he's been terrific and, and super helpful and common sense on everything that we talked to him about. So thank you. Yes, we've seen on the news this morning, uh, they're talking about an electric semi-truck. Imagine a whole fleet of these things drawing juice at one time. What, the, what Can you guys supply that kind of energy? Yeah, that's, so that's part of the problem with the electric vehicles is the, the increase in demand that they're going to put on our system and, and our combined systems at the same time they're shutting down the reliable sources of power generation. So it doesn't add up. It, it does, there's there's got to be a break point here. Common sense has got to come into play sooner or later. Yep. You can, yeah, I can hear you. Have you seen the video? Uh, a friend of mine sent it to me. Supposedly, okay, we all know China is the largest producer of EVs in the world, right? Do you know where they all are? I don't. According to this video that I saw, and I'd be happy to send it to anybody who wants to see it, every one of them, brand new cars with brand new batteries in running order in a big graveyard in China. Nobody's driving them. They don't have the electricity to run them, but because they are the largest producer of EVs in the world, they have to keep that up. But according to this video, it was an Australian reporter who did the video and did the news program. And he can the whole field of these all electric vehicles that are not being used. They are sitting in a graveyard because they can't run. I don't know, um, but there's not a lot of uptake around here. So we haven't, we haven't seen a lot of interest in them around here yet. Uh, any other questions? More. They said it helps stop pollution, and yet they spray it with weed poison so they keep the weed out. I don't understand how it's helping anybody. Yeah. There are all towns going to do you think we'll buy them at all, or is that not a I mean, every time I didn't hear it. Like, yeah, I didn't catch all of that. Um, yeah, we're not, you said Walpock? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm not familiar with, with what that is. Yeah. You got one over there? Cool. I have a question about the land ownership that, who basically control a lot of the things going on, relies on what the owner of the land does. So what is being done to keep Chinese investors or foreign investors or multi-billionaires from America or anywhere to keep buying all our farmland when they're going to be able to make all the decisions like where these wind farms, solar farms, anything to generate electricity goes on. We need some kind of legislature to control foreign investment. So I just wonder if there's anybody fighting for that. So I think there's there's two questions. One is foreign adversarial land purchases, and then the other is separate, which is uh, maybe foreign solar farms or wind farms. So uh, myself, and along with Representative Kloppenstein, we are joint sponsors for House Bill 212, which is a foreign adversary bill that will prohibit our foreign adversaries from purchasing land here in the state of Ohio. And um, We've been working on that for, uh, well, since I took office. And um, so we have, um, we'll be introducing, it, it is um, dropped, but we will be speaking to that probably, hopefully in a month or so. We um, are tweaking the language. We recently found out that in the budget, um, the Senate was able to get a farm protection uh, language into the budget. I believe it's it's now been enacted, effective mm -hmm. October 3rd. I think the Ohio Revised Code is 5301.256, and it does prohibit foreign adversaries from purchasing land, um, farmland in Ohio. And um, this is a great concern both to myself and, 
and Roy. Um, my family's involved in um, farming. Roy is a farmer. We know the land is precious, and um, once that leaves Ohio to foreign adversaries, the likelihood of it coming back is very slim. It was already addressed here that our family farms, those numbers are diminishing, and so very passionate about protecting our agriculture communities. Ohio, um, number one industry is agriculture, and in the 84th, we're number one in agri seats, number one in corn, cattle, hogs, soybeans, um, eggs, and po um, poultry and eggs. So agriculture is a strong part of who we are, part of our foundational values. So we're committed to protecting Ohio's ag land. So. One of the challenges of this bill, and, and every time we think we got it about right, um, there's another situation comes up. And, and what was put in the budget mainly protects agricultural land. But as we talk to other legislators across the country, and I, I think there are like 18, 19, 20 states that are prohibiting ownership of land to various groups or entities. The drive for economic development and jobs, regardless of where it's at in Ohio, we'll talk about Ohio, is in a room like this, we're going to get almost a super majority of people that says restrict ownership. But in the economic development world, the people that want jobs and want to bring jobs here aren't so in love with this bill. And our argument, and we continue to do research, and, and one of the things, and I don't want to go on too long, but there was just a case in California where there's an indiscreet building, and it was a bio lab, and it was run by China. And if you, if you look it up, it's incredible what has happened right under our nose. Our contention, and I don't want to speak for Rep King, but it's not just ag land. I mean, if the Chinese buy 80 acres next to me, what are they going to do with it other than farm it or I, I'm not sure the ag land is the issue or my concern, but if they buy a office building in downtown Columbus that's next to a data center and their intent is to steal data, your data, my data, and that we're not restricting all real property, it's more than ag land. It's everything. The current bill, I believe, is one mile from Wright-Patterson? Well, it, one mile, you realize we can spy. We got a satellite that can read the logo on a golf ball. So, so the whole thing is just sort of ludicrous. And, and we're, we're trying to get everybody to play nice at the table, and that's not possible. But we're working on it. Um, what we would really like, we won't get. But we're about protecting Ohio citizens. We're about protecting our way of life. We're about protecting our borders. Um, we're always swimming upstream. We get that after a while. But we're working on it. Stay tuned. Um, it just, you know, as a farmer, and this is going down the rabbit hole I talked about earlier, you know, on the farm, if we break something this morning, we hope to have it fixed by this afternoon. At the commissioner level, if something broke, we'd get it fixed in a couple days. At the state level, I tell folks, if Rome catches on fire, Rome's going to burn down before we deal with it. <laughs> so it's very slow moving. We're working on it. We get the concerns. And, and we, it, it's just a battle to protect our farm ground. But we think it's more than that. That was a long answer. Sorry. All right, uh, a satellite that can read a logo on a golf ball. I could use that to find a bunch of lost golf balls. So um, I think that's uh, enough for today. Uh, they're going to be sticking around. And again, Timothy Schneider from Senator Vance's office is here. If you have any issues you want to talk about uh, with uh, Senator Vance's office, Pat Laughlin, Midwest Electric will still be here at 10 o'clock. We've got safety demonstrations. And then later today is lunch. So thank you again for being a part of this group and for coming out this morning. Thank you.